Gospel of John, chapter 16, <coughs> verses 7 through 14. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many, many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Our second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were, named, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongue, tongues and prophecy. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. So ends the reading of this is holy word. Grant to God that the words of my life. <laughs> The meditations of each of our hearts will be gathered up by you, will be measured, and found always to be acceptable in your sight. God, who is our strength and our redeemer. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. For week three of this sermon series, I believe, uh, Reflections on the Apostles' Creed. And I contended in week one that I think it's really important that we understand what we believe and why, especially in the day that we live in now, that uh, it's not good enough to simply say, I believe. The New Testament says that we have to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. So we're using the Apostles' Creed as a framework, these basic affirmations of the Christian faith, to talk about what we believe and why as Christians. So in week one, we talked about the first statement, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And what I pointed out is that the, the, the powerful creator stuff is what comes second. What comes first is I believe in God, the Father. That, 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 that God's power and his, his work in creation are not his primary characteristics. His primary characteristic is that of being relational and loving and a father. God created not because he had to, but because he wanted to, out of his desire for relationship, out of the, the love that he wanted to share, that's why God created. And that's the God that we follow. Last week we talked about the second statement, I believe in Jesus Christ and all that, that follows that. Pastor Kathy talked about the, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that to say that Jesus Christ is Lord is to say that not only is he king and ruler over the whole universe, but that he's king and ruler over my heart. That the, the one who is risen and exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father and, and rules the universe is the one that's supposed to be ruling our hearts as well. This week we move to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And when you look at the Creed, you see the short paragraph about the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and uh, then there's this lengthy statement about Jesus Christ. You come to the Holy Spirit, and there's one line. That's it. I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
Full stop. And it makes you wonder if maybe the Holy Spirit isn't as important. The truth is, this couldn't be farther from the truth. We have to look at the, uh, the historical reasons that the creeds were written to start to understand this. There were uh, several creeds written, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and others, and they were written by councils. And these councils came together to uh, confront heresies or false teachings that have risen uh, in the church. The creeds were meant to be doctrinal statements to correct these false teachings. And when the Apostles' Creed was written, Jesus was the issue that needed addressed. There was a false teaching in the church that he was, you know, he was a, he was a good guy, but maybe not quite divine. So the Apostles' Creed puts a lot of effort into defining that, that this is the divine work of the Messiah. It seems like the work of the Holy Spirit was kind of a settled issue for these folks. That's why it's shorter. However, if you were to grab the hymnal in front of you, I know at 11 o'clock service, we're not like at all used to doing that. It's the red book in front of you that has a layer of dust on it. If you were to flip over to page 880, you would find another creed. It's a lengthier creed, and in fact, it's, it's the Nicene Creed. In fact, I prefer it doctrinally uh, to the Apostles' Creed, but that's for a different sermon. Uh, and you will find a much lengthier statement about the Holy Spirit. You, you, there are some things in common with the creed when it talks about God the Father and, and God the Son, and then we get to the, the, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. When the Council of Nicaea gathered, there was this false teaching running around that the Holy Spirit somehow was lesser than God the Father and God the Son. Not, not as important. And, and they knew this was not true, so they gathered and they put their minds together and they prayed that the Holy Spirit was guiding them and writing the creed, and they issued this belief statement about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. But the Nicene Creed is, is, is longer and it belongs more in line with the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. The Apostles' Creed is what took root in the West. So I think as time wore on, we did take that statement, I believe, in the Holy Spirit, the, the shorter statement, to mean that the Holy Spirit was somehow less important. And that became this, this mindset. And then the Protestant Reformation really didn't help matters at all. And we're all, in case you didn't know, we're all products of the Protestant Reformation, meaning that we're not Roman Catholic. And the, uh, the Reformers were pushing back against the many excesses of the, mid, of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. And they were emphasizing the person and work of Jesus and that salvation can be found in faith in Him alone. This was something they needed to emphasize. Absolutely, it's the right emphasis. However, the result was they ended up de-emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit. And that became a problem for the church. There's a bit of a revival about thought and interaction with the Holy Spirit by the time the Wesleys come along with the Wesleyan revival that, that carries into the First and Second Great Awakenings, the Welsh revival, Azusa Street, the Asbury revival. You can look up all those, Google and God did some really cool things. In these places... The Holy Spirit really showed up. There were miraculous healings, signs and wonders, all these things that we thought maybe ended in the, in, the, in the New Testament. They were things that we found out, hey, those things are still available to the church today. But then a problem happened in all of those revivals. People started seeking those signs, those really cool signs and wonders and miraculous healings, the signs of the Spirit, more than they were seeking the Spirit Himself. It became a problem. So that's enough history. Where has that left us? It's left us with a forgotten God. We can grasp God the Creator and Father. Jesus we get. We talk about God the Father. We talk about Jesus all the time. But the Holy Spirit, He makes us a bit uneasy. Especially if you've ever read about, about the Holy Spirit in the King James Version where He's not the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Ghost. Creepy. <laughs> Problematic. So what I want to do this morning is to answer three questions that really each one could be their own sermon, but I'm going to try to do it in a way that we can absorb and, and, and be challenged by. I'm going to pose three questions to us. One, who is the Holy Spirit? Two, what does the Holy Spirit do? And three, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? So first, who is the Holy Spirit? Simply put, the Holy Spirit is God. More specifically, the Holy Spirit is God's active work in our lives. The Holy Spirit is God's way of leading us, guiding us, forming us, shaping us. 
He is God's power and presence to comfort and encourage us to make us the people that God wants us to be. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God whispering, wooing, beckoning us. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. So often, we, it probably comes out of the uneasiness we feel about the Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit as it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. This is where the concept of Trinity is really important. In the early days of the Christian faith, the Christians were accused of worshiping three separate gods when they talked about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which was a big problem for their Jewish counterparts, who were the first monotheists. One God. But really, they were saying, we believe in one God that is eternally existed in three personalities. Great. That's confusing. What does that mean? How can you be one God with three personalities? God's not schizophrenic. <laughs> there are a lot of analogies out there that are meant to help us understand how there can be one God with three personalities. They all start to break down at some point, but some of them are helpful, like an egg. That you have the shell, the white, and the yolk, but it's still one egg. Okay? Or water can exist as, as liquid vapor or ice as a, as a solid or human beings that we're one person but we have different hats that we wear or roles uh, that we that we play like I'm, I'm Larry but I'm a husband I'm a pastor I'm a father one person three different hats that that I wear again all these analogies start to break down at some point one of them that I found to be the most helpful is a is an old Latin concept. It's called the, the scutum fide, which is which means shield of faith. And I think we have a picture of it. Maybe there it is. This is the shield of faith. This is this is the best way that I've found to understand the Trinity. You can follow along with it. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. However, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. One God eternally existed in three distinct personalities. This is how we know that God is relational. That from the foundations of the earth, the Trinity existed. And out of this relationship of love that exists within the Trinity, the universe is born and we were created to be relational beings as well. When we say that we believe in the Holy Spirit, we're declaring that the Holy Spirit is God. Not an it, not a manifestation. The Holy Spirit is God, a distinct personality of God. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Second question, what does the Holy Spirit do? We have to look through Scripture to start to figure this out. In, in the Bible, Old and New Testament, the word spirit occurs approximately 500 times. In the Old Testament, the word is ruach, which means wind or breath. Or spirit. If you go to the very beginning, the, the foundation of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says that the Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit is present in creation. That it's, it's the Ruach. What we see of the Ruach in the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit coming on particular people for particular occasions. To give them strength and wisdom and leadership. That's really important because we're going to see a change in that in the New Testament. Particular people for particular occasions. And Deuteronomy 34 is the, one of the earliest examples of this. Uh, it begins this tradition of leaders laying hands on those who would succeed them and pouring out the Holy Spirit on them. In Deuteronomy 34, Moses lays hands on Joshua and it says he became full of the, of the Spirit of wisdom. The same is true throughout the Old Testament. The anointing of kings and great warriors and judges and prophets, the Spirit comes upon particular people for particular occasions. However, the prophet Joel sees a day coming where all that's going to change. It will no longer be particular people for particular occasions. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he prophesies a day that God's going to reveal his spirit in a different way. It says this, Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. No longer particular people for particular occasions. Now the spirit one day would be available to all people. Young, old, men, women, <laughs> servants, not servants, rulers. The spirit will be poured out. Joel sees this day coming. In the New Testament, we see Joel's words fulfilled. No longer is the spirit given to particular people for particular occasions. So that they could be remarkable or gifted leaders for Israel. Now, 
The Spirit is poured out on all. The unremarkable, the ordinary, they receive the Holy Spirit. Throughout the Old Testament, there's about 80 to 90 different references to the Holy Spirit. But I told you there's 500 in the Bible. 80 to 90, the rest are in the New Testament. There's an explosion of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Hear it? Pneumatic? Anything powered by air. Pipe organ? Air brakes? Pneumatology? You get the point. In the passage of scripture that was shared from John this morning, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the advocate. That's from a Greek word paraclete. Para, close by, very near, beside. Yeah, you hear paralegal in that as well. It was a legal term. It was an advocate for the defense, a defense lawyer who comes alongside to stand with the accused to be their voice. Outside of the legal system, paraclete was used to talk about those who, who came close to the hurting, to hold them, to comfort them. So the advocate that Jesus is talking about is a comforter, and a helper, and a defender. The Holy Spirit, as God, is, is God's force that permeates everything in our world. The Holy Spirit is God's presence working within us, coming alongside us, empowering us, and guiding us, shaping us, shaping everyone who's open to his power. When you look at what Jesus said in John chapter 16, we start to get an idea of what role the Holy Spirit is supposed to have in the life of the church and the lives of individuals who follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit's main role is to share God's grace with us, specifically the grace that we call sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace simply is God's gift that gives us the desire and the power to grow in our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit gives us sanctifying grace so that we can grow to be more like Jesus. The advocating, helping, comforting, convicting Holy Spirit is at work in our lives from when we first draw breath, then drawing us and moving us into relationship with God, softening our hearts, giving us the courage to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work in restoring us in our relationship with God and others. We, we can't earn God's love by changing ourselves. Rather, we change in response to God's love because the Spirit gives us that ability to respond. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says that even the ability to cry out and call God Father is because the Spirit has told us and enabled us to do that. He says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it's that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit enables us to be restored in our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit's at work in, in imparting new life, new light, new strength, and a new heart to us. The Holy Spirit imparts God's righteousness and holiness in us, making us more like Jesus each day. There's a difference between imputing and imparting. Uh, think about your family of origin. That, that, most of that is imputed to you. Uh, I was born with a Frank name, imputed to me. Uh, then there were certain characteristics that were imputed to me, like height and hair color, eye color, nose, unfortunately. Uh, those are imputed characteristics that are, that are handed down through genetics. But as I grew and matured, certain family characteristics were imparted to me. Love of baseball, love of fishing, my particular affinity for our family farm in Missouri, my maternal grandmother's family is Syrian, and I love all food Mediterranean. Those are things that, that are imparted to me, that, that, that you live into over time. The Holy Spirit works in the same way. When we say yes to following Jesus, we're declared guilt-free. We're, we're, we're given the name the, the family name of free, redeemed, set free, not guilty, Christian. But as we grow and open ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit, we're imparted with more and more and more of what it means to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work in perfecting us in the image of God and into the likeness of Jesus. And as we open ourselves to the presence and power of the Spirit, and as we mature in our Christian life, we start to display certain qualities that Paul called the fruits of the Spirit. You probably remember them from Sunday school. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then I look at that list and I go, huh. <laughs> you read that list. How, how much of that is always evident in your life? Are you always, uh, no, I lost it. Are you always loving and joyful? And peaceful, a peacemaker. Are you always patient? <laughs> kind, generous, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <laughs> <laughs> we don't become 
perfect in the fruit of the Spirit instantly. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that continues perfecting us, making us more like Jesus all the time. That's the continual work of the Holy Spirit, bringing about sanctifying grace in us. Look over your life. How many places in your life are you different than you used to be? In the best way possible. I was talking to someone this week about, about being different even than the person that I was in high school. And, and great God, I'm not the person that I should be, but at least I'm not that person anymore. I thank God I'm not the person I was 10 years ago, 5 years ago, yesterday. That, that as we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we, be, we start to show evidence of the fruits of the Spirit more and more each day. I'm not perfectly loving or joyful or peaceful or patient or kind. But I'm better than I used to be. That's the work of the Holy Spirit growing in us. It's a good Southern Illinois term, used to would have done. I'm not perfect, but I'm a lot better than I used to would have done. And that's thanks to the Holy Spirit. I bet you could find those places in your life, too. The Holy Spirit is God's presence that always brings us more. More love, more power, more peace, more joy. It's always in store for us as we open ourselves to the Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit equips us to do the work of Christ in the world, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, as Jesus is about to ascend to the Father, he tells the disciples, you're going to be my witnesses in all these places, in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. But he tells them that they're going to be his witnesses when the Spirit comes on them. Before you go out trying to change the world, before you go out buying trouble when it's not on sale, wait until you get some power. And it didn't take long. In Acts chapter 2, we know we talk about it on, uh, on Pentecost Sunday when we celebrate the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes upon the early church as a violent rushing wind fills the disciples to overflowing. They start to speak in other languages and the gospel is heard to all of these people who are, who are visiting. They can hear it in their own languages and, and God does something really amazing and cool that day. It's the Holy Spirit that does those things. It's the Holy Spirit that gives spiritual gifts to believers to use in the world and the church so that the whole of God's will can be accomplished. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Last question, how are we filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we get some of that Acts chapter 2? That in, in filling of the Holy Spirit. How do I get some of that Galatians 5.22 where I start to bear that fruit? How do we interact with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit for this work of convicting and comforting and converting and restoring and pardoning, perfecting and equipping? How do I get some of that? There are times, like the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit just, just moves so powerfully that, there, that you can't deny that something is happening. That they experience the violent and rushing wind. And, and there have been times in my life where the presence of the Holy Spirit is so strong and real that I can barely stand on my feet. You, you can feel it. The conference that I went to a couple weeks ago called the New Room Conference is one of those places for me. It's one of those places where I expect to see those signs and wonders and miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I long for those moments. I, I, I live for those moments. However, that's not the primary way that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go off to Nashville to a new conference. We're filled with the Spirit by opening ourselves to the Spirit daily through prayer and study by serving God in the world. We have to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit daily. Romans 5.5 5 says that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. We don't earn the presence of the Holy Spirit. We just open ourselves to Him. As we open ourselves to being filled with the Spirit, we'll find the Spirit moving in all sorts of ways, big and small, every single day. How are we filled with the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, seeking to, to, to speak to us, to call us, to shape us, to empower us. But the Holy Spirit will not force Himself on you. We can make the choice to resist God the Holy Spirit, or we can welcome and invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in us. We do that invitation on behalf of people. Think about when we baptize someone in the church. Immediately after they're baptized, we lay hands on them, and we say, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. We, we pray the same prayer, confirmation. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in the life of, of the young person being confirmed. 
And that's part of the biblical tradition that we see in the second passage that we read this morning in Acts chapter 19. This, this group of people encounter Paul and uh, he says, uh, when you became followers of, uh, of Jesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said this awful thing. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. What bothers me the most about that, we operate a lot the same way. We talk about God, we talk about Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, as I said, is kind of this forgotten God. He makes us a little uneasy, and we think, you know, the Pentecostals can have the Holy Spirit. They've kind of got the corner on the Holy Spirit. I've got news for us. The Pentecostals are part of the Wesleyan holiness tradition. They came from us. What we've lost. What we've forgotten of the power and the presence and the working of the Holy Spirit. So Paul corrects them right there and he, and he baptizes them in the name of Jesus and he lays hands on them and says immediately they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want us to make the same mistake as whoever converted them. I don't want us to try to operate without the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. When I was ordained, the bishop laid hands on my head in that same biblical tradition and said, Almighty God, pour upon Larry David Frank the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. And I don't know if the, it was just the wind from the air conditioner and, and, and I was sweating so much I could feel on the back of my neck, but I have to believe that some kind of transaction occurred that day. I felt it. I felt him. It was a holy moment in my life. And it can be in yours too when we pray this every day. My first prayer every morning when I wake up, and many times throughout the day, is one of the most ancient prayers of the church. Veni Sanctus Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and speak to me. Come and use me. Come and work through me. Come and change me. And what I found is it's, it's not always easy to hear the Holy Spirit, but the more I pray that prayer, the more I pay attention. The more I am open to those big and powerful moments with the Spirit, but also to those gentle nudges from the Holy Spirit. A nudge that's really real for me right now. Um, you know, well, the last Saturday, our sister Joyce passed, and um, I had a nudge moment in that. Uh, I was asleep on my couch because the Cubs are playing such incredible baseball right now, and uh, fell asleep during the game. And my phone was plugged in in the in the other room, and I'm I'm trying to to put the phone down a little bit more and be more present to my family, which I was doing a really good job of sleeping on the couch as well. <laughs> but I woke up from my sleep and I, I, I felt this nudge to go grab my phone. It, it was just this undeniable, go grab your phone. And I saw that I had a missed call from Judy. I'm so grateful on the back end of that that I got that nudge. Those nudges happen when we say, come Holy Spirit, use me, speak to me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. When we pray, come Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to that still, small voice. We listen for the Spirit's prompting in our lives and in the church. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Creed says. It's a short, simple statement, but it's bold. Believing and trusting and opening ourselves to the Holy Spirit can and will change your life. The voices that we listen to are so important. They mold us, they shape us, so why not listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? Invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in you, comforting, guiding, shaping, empowering you. I don't want us to miss that opportunity like those guys back in Acts 19. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. I want us to live life in the Spirit as individuals and as a church. If you've never prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, ask Him today. Ask Him to come and move in your life. In fact, we're going we're to pray that together. And I told you Pentecostals don't have a corner on this, so Methodists, hold on. I'm not going to make you do that. But just put your hands in your lap. Open. Bow your heads. Your hands in your lap as if you're going to receive a blessing. You're going to receive a gift that someone's putting in your hand. Take a few deep breaths. Imagine yourself breathing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And 
and exhale those things that you know the Holy Spirit wants to prune out of your life. Your hurt, your anger, bitterness, your doubt. Breathe in the Holy Spirit. And let everything else go. The Holy Spirit, the Lord, is here with us now. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to go slowly so that you can pray this prayer in your breath and in your heart as you receive this presence. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. I need you. Breath of God, fill me completely. Form me and shape me into the person you want me to be. Lead me to do what you want me to do. Empower me and use me. Speak to me and for me. Produce your fruit in me. Help me to listen to your voice above all other voices that clamor for my attention. Come, Holy Spirit. I need you. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the gift of God that stirred in us. That's the gift of God that's promised to us in our baptism with the laying on of hands of the, the pastor of, of those who, who, are, who are there saying that the Holy Spirit be poured out in your life. And I pray that over you today. May the Holy Spirit be poured out in your life in ways that are just without understanding. Are miraculous, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on you in a way that you can never be the same, and this world will never be the same because of the Spirit's leading in your life. 